Thank you. So uh, my name is uh, Jelte. Uh, I'm from Vestas, working in the renewable energy sector. Uh, I was a trained physicist originally, then went into, uh, into Vestas and working with, with data there. Uh, so what I'm talking about today is something that I find very interesting, is the enhancement of Earth observational data. Uh, you, you will know what that is in a moment, and how we apply deep learning to solve that problem. So first of all, a little teaser. So is, it, is this a good piece of art? Well, maybe. We don't know. We don't see the full picture. We just see a small square of it. So if you see the full picture, ah, yeah, okay, it's a good piece of art. At least that's commonly agreed upon. We, do, we can say the same for a, for a site to put up a wind turbine. Is this a good site to put up a wind turbine? Well, we don't know. We don't know the full picture yet. So how do we get there uh, to know the full picture? The last part of, of getting the full picture is to putting up a meteorological mast. So what you actually do is you put up a mast with a weather station, measuring station, and measure for a year. So then you have a time series of a year, and you know if this was a good site. But before you get there, there's a lot of preparation. You need to know, ah, is this a good place to put up a, a, a weather mast? Because, I mean, you, you put up a mast in the height of the turbine, Turbines today are more than 100 meters tall, maybe 200 meters. So you put up a metal tower of 200 meters, and you don't just do that everywhere and measure for a year. That's pretty expensive. So we need to figure out beforehand where to put up these uh, weather stations. And we use the weather station meteorological masts. We use them to verify all of the preparation before setting up the mast. So in order to prepare for that, we have a tool in Vestas called SiteHunt. And SiteHunt is used for figuring out where to put up the turbines, where to put up the weather mast, the uh, mid masts. So we have, in SiteHunt, we have pre-computed three kilometer resolution for the entire globe. I'll get back to that data set. So it's very quick to see aggregate data for many years. Where are the good sites? Where, the, where are the high wind speeds on average? So here, for example, warm colors mean that means that there are high wind speeds on average. Cool colors means that it's low wind speed. So now three kilometer resolution, that's pretty, pretty long when you want to put up a, a meteorological mast somewhere. Do I put it up here or one kilometer there or 20 meters that direction? We don't know. So we need to go further down, increase the resolution. That's, of course, expensive uh, a model. Uh, of this kind, it's a physical model where we do a flow model, basically solving Navier-Stokes equations, and that's expensive. It's 10 times more expensive to go from three kilometer to one kilometer. So it takes 10 times as long if the complexity of the terrain is sort of the same. So this is not something you do for the entire globe. Even going down to 300 meters, that's even more expensive. And now the final part, when we found a good spot, is to really deep dive on that area in order to plan where to put a whole wind park, so really plan where to put the individual turbines with respect to each other. And of course, this is very high uh, resolution, so very small uh, steps, which means that it's very expensive. So this is the final part before now we are prepared to put up a wind turbine, or put up a meteorological mast to verify that this is the right place to put wind turbines. So today, we have average wind speeds for a period of time, but this is not what people want, what, what, um, what you want from the grid. So wind energy is becoming more and more present, more and more uh, higher and higher uh, percentage of the, of the energy mix which means that we need to know when the uh, turbines produce energy, and not just how much per year, because we want to have power in the sockets, we want to have light all day long when we turn on the power, not just when we have a wind, a high-speed wind, so we can have turbines uh, spinning. So to get there, we need to know on a time basis when do we have high winds, and it needs to be there at the right time. So the way we do that currently, or estimate that, is through physical models, what we showed here in, in, uh, for Cyton, but that's computationally very expensive. So this is uh, several wind resource enrichments. This is the Earth observational data uh, that we have for the, uh, uh, from Cyton. 
And now, instead of doing the expensive models, we could do just statistical approaches to go from three kilometers to one kilometer, 300 meters. Those statistical approaches, they work 90% of the time, and they fail for very complex terrains, very complex uh, uh, hills, or, or how it could be. And this is, unfortunately, also where the physical models are expensive to run. So, what we want to do is to build a system, initially, that beats the statistical baseline, or the statistical approach, oops, beat the statistical approach, and is cheaper than the physical models. So we don't attempt to beat the physical models, because that's really, really difficult, but we want to beat just using plain statistics. And now we've seen some of the things that Google can do, could do with uh, super-resolution images, and we decided to jump on the hype <laughs> and do deep learning on the, uh, apply deep learning to this problem. And it has proven very successful, so let's see if we can replicate it. Before we go there, I'll just go through what tools we have available, because that has impacted which choices we've made along the way, and also what data we have available. And finally, what we need to build ourselves in order to succeed. So first of all, we happen to have a, a, a high-performance compute cluster. Also, my team is managing that, so we can play a bit of tricks. It has 650 compute nodes. It was about on the top 500 list when it was commissioned in 2016. We have a lot of memory, a lot of CPU cores, and a lot of storage. I'll get back to why we need a lot of storage, more than five petabytes. And it has GPU nodes. So we have 20 Tesla GPUs that we want to utilize. But everything is managed through a SunGrid engine. So that's a, a schedule out so that we can schedule jobs uh, for those who have the highest priority. You also have a lot of data. And now the the first view you saw from, uh, from Cyton with the three kilometer uh, resolution, the pre computed grids, the pre computed images, those are from the climate library. So, actually, from the climate library, we have since 2000 the entire globe, where there's land and not oceans, we have with a three kilometer resolution each hour how wind was blowing since 2000. That's 19, almost 19 years of data, hourly wind data, three kilometer resolution. That's more than one and a half petabytes, so 1,500 terabytes. It's a lot. Now, it is more than 50 parameters, so it's, we have sun radiation, we have wind speeds at different altitudes, pressures and everything. We don't use all of it, but we have a lot of it available. Everything with Climate Library and the work from this started in 2012, 2012 and it's stored in ORC. So we're using Spark and, and the likes to query the data. On top of that, we have a high-resolution um, elevation database, so that's height on the ground. Um, we have a roughness database, so roughness, like if there's trees, lakes, whatever, that, that kind of roughness gives different properties to the wind flow that can impact how much energy we can, we can gather from the wind. Now, to give you an idea, about this climate library, what is in there, we have here for the US, average wind speeds at 80 meters above ground. At ground level, 80 meters above, what is the wind speed? Warm colors, high wind speeds. So this works, so high wind speeds here, low wind speeds here. So now we will do a lot of filters to get possible candidate sites to put up uh, uh, to continue our search for a good site to put up turbines. So we remove terrain above 1,500 1, meters. It's because the density is low, so we can't gather as much energy from wind speeds there. We want to have the wind speed on average above three meters per second. This is the wind speed that we can start to gather energy from the turbines. Now, we cannot put up turbines in national parks, protected areas, federal land, and so on. We also don't want to put turbines up in the cities or airports. And finally, we want to be close to the high voltage grid. So we don't want to draw a long high, high, power, high voltage line to get onto the grid with the energy that we produce. We also want to produce energy where it's needed. So finally, all of this goes into the siting process. So where to make a site, where to attempt to put up turbines. 
and make a, a measurement campaign with a MedMast. And now comes our solution, because, okay, we have the three kilometer data in a climate library pre-computed. We want to downscale that to one kilometer resolution, maybe even better. And we want to do it cheap and fast. So we want to build a pipeline, a technical solution, where we extract some data, prepare the data, build a model, and we need to do some hyperparameter search, because this is, you need to build the best model to solve the, solve the problem, train the model and evaluate, and then go back, probably make changes to the data preparation, so on, until we get to a final model that we can deploy. So pretty basic stuff, you've seen that many times today. So now we made a proof of concept. Again, we want to beat the statistical approach, and we want to do it cheaper than if we use the physical models. This is our target. First of all, a bit of the data extraction and data preparation. These are the two first boxes. Right now, again, it's a POC type uh, um, work, so it is sort of convoluted, so we uh, or mixed. So we, s we have the wind data, 1.5 petabytes. We use Spark to extract some data. We have elevation data, that's 400 gigabytes. And finally, roughness data, that's roughly the same size as the elevation data. That we extract with Python. Everything is stored in Hive, and from there we make some uh, derived features. Like, okay, so this is a vector field. We have wind, energy, wind speeds and wind directions, and we can do some, uh, some derived features like curl, divergence, and Laplacian that the uh, neural network does not at the moment or in the beginning know of, but it, can be, it is very important for the physics of, of the system. Finally, we use Spark and PySpark to extract the data and put it into, uh, into the models. Okay, just again, what we have in the, in the climate library and why we spend a lot of time on actually preparing the data to put into the model. So we have the data in a three by three kilometer grid, but the Earth is a sphere, which means that we cannot map directly a Cartesian grid onto the Earth. So it's not exactly a square grid, Cartesian grid. Also, there's not exactly three kilometers between all of them. And it is not when we pull it out of the database, then the patches, that, because we cannot run a model for three, uh, three kilometer resolution of the entire Earth at one time, we put it into patches, and the patches might not be aligned perfectly uh, like a square, so some of them might be a bit slanted, which makes it a bit more difficult to extract the data. Again, it's a three kilometer resolution with global coverage for 19 years. Almost. Then we have for Saudi Arabia, for one year, we have one kilometer uh, resolution. So that's the small point. Ooh. That's the small points in between. Where's that? The small points in between. This is the target that we want to predict. We have high resolution data, up to 30 meters resolution in between, but they are not necessarily at the same points as our uh, measurements, so we need to find the closest point always. So what we did initially was to reduce the complexity a bit for the input data by saying, okay, instead of attempting to put this into a square grid, we take one point and the surrounding eight points and we put that into one line. So that is one line per timestamp into the model. And then the next one, line number two, for that timestamp. So we get 25 lines for each patch that we extracted. It looks like this. And for this, we have wind speeds for a three kilometer resolution. We have hour of the day, temperature, sun radiation, things that we believe matters to describe the wind flow on, on, the, on this particular point. We feed, that into a neural, oops, we feed that into a neural network model and we want to target the high resolution U and V components. So U and V, that's the components in longitude and latitude of the wind speed with wind direction. So that's the vector components of the wind speed. And the baseline, this is for the linear model, this is the reason we chose only to put heights 
and the low resolution wind speeds is because this is the current model that's used by meteorologists in our department, actually used for uh, providing that to customers. So we want to beat that. I know you can't read this. This is only to show that what we do when we configure the, uh, the model is to put a JSON into our function. So we describe everything in human-readable JSON, and this describes our feed-forward neural network. So we opted to just run a feed-forward neural network. It was the simplest thing we could do. We just want to show that this is feasible. But now, how do we select the right feed-forward neural network? How do we select the right width and depth? Well, this is the hard problem, right? To do hyperparameter uh, selection to find the optimal uh, neural network. So, for example, just selecting four different number of width of the neural network, three different depths, two different uh, uh, percentages for dropout, and two different number of epochs gives us 48 combinations. So running all of them becomes tedious if you want to do it all, uh, manually on a single node. And splitting that and running it manually on many nodes, it's just that's not going to, uh, going to fly. So what we had to do was to find some tool that could do this for us. So we looked into several different tools, but none of them was really fit for the purpose because they were not coded with that in mind that you have a HPC compute cluster that you can just uh, throw the computations at. So, we had to rebuild something for ourselves. We used some parts of Talos. So, Talos is used to define which different combinations of, uh, uh, of hyperparameters can we, do we want to search. We use that to build an array of different combinations and feed that into our scheduler. And that will schedule the computation on our GPU nodes. So we package all of our uh, dependencies in Docker containers and run that on the GPUs. We use TensorBoard to get some quantitative measures on the performance of the models. Uh, and we have some output to, uh, to, to, um, so that we can go back and see what was actually the, res the result of this particular run. We divide our, uh, our data into a training data set, validation data set, and test data set. The training data set we use to take the candidate models and teach and learn, um, train those models. The validation set is used to select the best hyperparameters. And finally, the test set, we use that for the qualitative and quantitative benchmarking towards the, uh, towards the baseline. We use a combination of different evaluation measures in order to find the best model. And we use a qualitative sort of uh, visual inspection by humans in order to see does this model actually perform as we intended. Okay, now do we downscale? Can we actually downscale from a three kilometer resolution to a one kilometer resolution? This is the big question. So here's Saudi Arabia. We have four different pins here. This is the four regions that we took sample data from. There's a simple terrain. This is one of them I will be showing, and a complex terrain up here that I will also be showing. First, the simple terrain. This is uh, an enriched Google imagery. You can see some roughness, a bit difference in the heights here. But otherwise, it looks pretty uninteresting. These are the three kilometer heights that were fed into the physical model to calculate the wind flow, and the one kilometer heights for the one kilometer model. OK, so now comes the physical model, the physical flow model. We have three kilometer data, three kilometer model, that's the green arrows and the corresponding one kilometer resolution flow model is the black arrows. So you see there's sort of a bump in the center in the one kilometer model, but no bump in the three kilometer model. And we also definitely see that for the linear model. So this is the linear baseline model that we want to beat. You see the arrows, this is the linear model arrows, and the dots, that's the magnitude of the error vector at that point. So darker points, darker dots, means higher error. And you definitely see that the linear model on the diagonal does not really catch the bump in the wind flow. Can we beat that with a neural network model? Ah, maybe. It's better. The errors are better. So we definitely beat the linear model, but we 
don't really catch the physics here. So this was for a relatively complex wind flow for this area. A more simple wind flow, this is just a hard wind from southeast. Well, the errors are better for the neural network model compared to the linear model. So we beat the linear model, but it looks sort of the same sort of from qualitative inspection. So the quantitative measures definitely show that it's better. Qualitatively, ah, it's okay. So in general, so these are for two different timestamps. Again, we have one year of data with hourly time steps, so 24 points per day for a year. And these are the quantitative results that we use to benchmark the two models for a long period of time. So it's about a month that we used for, for, testing, for the test data. So we see that for the root mean square error, bias, and Pearson's R coefficient, the neural network model beats the two other baselines that we use, either linear regression or for the, three kilometer, for the one kilometer model, just select the closest three kilometer point and say that this is probably what it looks like. These are the two uh, baselines that we beat for everything except for this measure. This is the cumulative, dis uh, the cumulative distribution function of the errors that we sum, and that gives one measure that we also use to benchmark the models. And the reason the closest three kilometer point is better is that it is actually capturing extreme winds better than both the linear model and the neural network model. This is something that we want to improve as well. So now for a bit more complex terrain, harder to model. So you see this is very complex. There are a lot of uh, hills and valleys. Maybe it's even a road. You see for the three kilometer heights, this is the reason I chose the scale from zero to a thousand on the flat terrain that you can really see that th that was simple compared to this terrain. You have for, again, this is a 20 by 20 kilometer grid, and you have from 200 meters to 1,000 meters within 20 kilometers. So it's pretty difficult, it's pretty uh, diverse terrain. The one kilometer height, you definitely see there is a shoulder of a hill here, a valley, and a mo another shoulder. So the wind flow model for a relatively simple flow in this terrain looks like this. You see the three, kilometer, uh, the three kilometer flow doesn't really know about this shoulder, so it's just pretty uh, even along this uh, change here. But the one kilometer flow, there's definitely a shoulder here where the wind blows on, on either side of it. The linear model has no idea about the physics here. It cannot learn any of the physics in the problem, so it fails dramatically. It's, it's nowhere near catching any of the features of this, uh, of this shoulder here. There's a huge error in this, in this uh, area. So let's hope the neural network beats this. It does. It sort of catches that wind speeds are always low in this region, and it gets sort of the flow around here, but it's not perfect, of course. Now, for a bit more complex wind situation in this area, the linear model is completely lost. Based on the quantitative measures, the neural network is relatively good, but human inspections, I would say, ah, it's not good. <laughs> it's better than the linear model, but it's not perfect. So from the two figures here, two timestamps, we get the same picture as the quantitative results. The deep neural network definitely beats the other models, except for the bias, where the linear regression is better. Bias is the difference between the averages. And uh, exactly what that means, well, it has to be used in, com in combination with other quantitative measures. So let's take the same question again. Do we downscale? Maybe. There's room for improvement, but it's definitely better than what we intended to do. We wanted to beat the statistical methods, the linear model, and we want to do it cheaper than running a full-fledged simulation, physical simulation. So we reached our target, but there's room for improvement. So what could we do to improve this? Well, we could optimize on different evaluation measures. Right now, we just optimized on the root mean square error. But this, uh, this problem, this screams convolutional network. 
and not a feed-forward neural network. And we have the time dimension, so we should probably use a recurrent neural network instead of just a feed-forward neural network. So that's the two things we want to improve. And then, of course, putting in, giving more information to the neural network so the, to the neural network so that we can really start to compete with actually running physical simulations. We would like to avoid that and just go directly to a neural network. And this is not the only application. We have several other things we could apply machine learning for. So we have now a technical setup where we can easily define test cases, where we can submit that to our compute cluster. We have power forecasting, long-term correction of wind measures. That's two of the uh, things that we're already working on. And then there's a list of other things we would like to do. And the team, my colleague Anna and Hans, working in Denmark, and Thiago out of our Porto office, and then me. Okay, thank you for listening. <laughs>